For many, the pressing question is, how can God use me? What are the qualifications? What I personally wanted to find out when I started was, whom exactly did Jesus choose as his apostles and what were their qualifications? What I found turned out to be truly life-changing. I believe it is one of the most encouraging biblical truths you will ever hear. It is a principle that harkens all the way back to the Old Testament and still holds true today. Before Jesus chose his 12 disciples, we read that he went for an all-night prayer meeting. Luke chapter 6 verse 12 says, he went to a mountain and continued all night in prayer to God before he chose his 12 apostles. Now scholars say all night means 12 hours, let's say from either 6 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the evening to 7 o'clock in the morning. 12 hours. He prayed 12 hours mm. to choose 12 people, one hour per person, 12 men. So he prayed 12 hours. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. Mm -hmm. To know that Jesus possibly prayed one hour for each man. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know if Jesus had prayed personally one hour for you yes. or one hour for me? It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, he prayed 12 hours. After he had prayed those 12 hours, let's say 7 o'clock in the morning, he descends from the mountain, he arrives at the beach, of Lake Galilee, and if I read scripture right, he begins to choose his apostles. And this surprised me. It looked to me as if Jesus just chose the man as he bumped into them, <laughs> just at random. You two, yes, and one, two, three, you three, and you, and you, and you. How many have I got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I need three more, and what about you, and what about you, and you, twelve. There they all were. And then I said to myself, no, I cannot believe that Jesus prayed twelve hours for twelve men, and then he just picked them as they came. Mm -hmm. Why did Jesus pray 12 hours. What did Jesus pray for those 12 hours? Did he pray, my father, show me the best and the greatest man in Israel, the superman in Israel. I need superman as my apostles. So I asked myself, why did he choose those men this way and looking at it even a little closer I thought by myself without 
trying to be disrespectful to Jesus, allow me to say, I don't need to pray 12 hours and then after 12 hours go and make such bad choices. <laughs> Look whom he chose. He chose a man like Peter, impetuous Peter, <laughs> a man with a quick temper, this rough man, always acting first and then thinking second. <laughs> he chose the sons of Zebedee. Mm -hmm. They were hotheads. When the Samaritans refused overnight accommodation for Jesus and his disciples, the sons of Zebedee said, Lord, call down fire and burn down this village. Jesus chose them. I thought, what glorious apostles would those two men make? <laughs> Jesus said, you don't know what, of what spirit you are. This is not the spirit of Christ. He chose them. But worst of all, he chose Judas Iscariot. Yes, Judas betrayed him. But the Bible also says that Judas was a thief. And if anyone knew, Jesus knew. And Jesus made him the treasurer of the apostolic team. I want to warn any pastor, never appoint a thief to be your church treasurer. <laughs> but Jesus did it. Mm. Now, when I realized that Jesus had chosen these men with all their faults and all their mistakes, I said, I cannot believe that he prayed for 12 hours, Lord, show me the Superman, because none of them was a Superman. Mm -hmm. Why did Jesus pray 12 hours to choose people with such big faults. Mm -hmm. Why? Such ordinary people with their big mistakes. I said, Lord, why did you choose these people? Why did you have to pray 12 hours? And then something happened to me. I had an experience that really blessed me mightily. It was as if the Holy Spirit took me and put me on that mountain where Jesus prayed, put me right next to him so that I could hear his voice. I expected Jesus to pray for the great, to show him the greatest man in Israel, but he didn't. I heard something totally different. And I thought I could hear Jesus pray. I could even hear what he prayed. And what he prayed shook me. This is what I heard. Jesus prayed, my father, you know that I am about to choose my 12 apostles. Don't let me choose like the world chooses. Don't let me plan success as the kings of this world would plan their success. Mm. My Father, not my will, but your will be done. And it took 12 hours for Jesus to have the victory on that point. And then he came down from the mountain and he chose ordinary people. Amen. People like me and people like you. Amen. With all our mistakes, with our weaknesses, he still chooses us. I think if I had been Jesus, I wouldn't have gone to the beach for some ignorant fisherman. I think I would have gone to the University of Jerusalem. I would have said to the professors, give me a list 
of the finest young men, the sharpest brains, movers of people, great orators. I have a great commission that needs to go to the ends of the world. Give me the best of the young men you have here at the university. Jesus didn't come close to a university. He chose ordinary people, ordinary people. Jesus does not choose us because of what we are, but because of what he makes from us. Mm -hmm. And here is our great chance. Oh, amen. God doesn't need Superman mm -hmm. and he doesn't need superwomen. I'll tell you why he didn't pick Superman. He didn't pick Superman because there were no Superman in Israel. There are no Superman in America. There are no Superman in, in Germany or in Britain or in China or in India. There are some Superman in Hollywood, but they are all fakes. <laughs> Jesus chooses ordinary people. And this is how he chose these people there. Now, my father was a, a pastor. I heard the gospel from my earliest years. That is the greatest inheritance I, I have in this world. When I was nine years of age, I received Jesus Christ as my savior. And when I was 10, just one year later, in that little church in North Germany, where I grew up, it was some kind of a mission meeting. Um, suddenly, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And the Lord said, Reinhard, when you are grown up, you shall preach the gospel in Africa. I was so overwhelmed. I jumped up. I ran forward, I put my arms around my dad, I started to cry. I said, Papa, God has spoken to me. My father said, son, what did he say to you? I said, he said to me, when you are grown up, you shall preach the gospel in Africa. My father said to me, Reinhardt, your oldest brother shall be my successor. Wow. You know, I was not my father's choice. My father picked my oldest brother because he was the best at school in mathematics. And I was the worst. <laughs> but in the meantime, I have found out that mathematics has not yet saved one soul but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We may not be the choice of people, but Jesus is here to point with his finger at you. And he says, I have chosen you yes. to go and preach the word of God. Amen. In Germany, we have a saying, when somebody is no good, really no good, we say, that one over there is a zero. The German word for us is null. He's just a null. He's just a zero. He, 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 he fails his exams. He can't find a job or can't hold a job. He's just a zero. Well... I must be honest with you, when God called me, I was just a zero, just a zero. But listen to what happened. When God called me being a zero, I responded. I came to Jesus and I stood next to him. That moment I made the discovery of my life because I discovered that Jesus is the number one. Yes. And when I, as the zero, stood next to him, we were already ten. Wow. 
<laughs> Any other zero here? Come and stand next to me, and we are already 100. Yeah. Any more zeros? 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, yeah. 10 million. And then I realized Jesus puts value into every zero. Mm -hmm. I don't even mind to be the last zero yeah. because the last zero is the most valuable. Mm -hmm. A hundred million is more than a hundred. Yes. As long as the one is in front, Jesus, uh -huh. we are all highly valuable. Mm -hmm. But take the one away and we are all but zeros mm -hmm. again. This is how God calls, how he chooses. It's a secret that needs to be understood. Mm. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are. Jesus makes you valuable, highly valuable. Mm. He calls you, he equips you, mm. and he sends you, yes, and God. he will be with you. All the way, right till the end of time and to the end of the earth. much in ourselves, just fragile centers of consciousness. If God failed to keep this planet at a fairly even temperature, people would soon vanish. Our intellects are limited. We are fallen creatures. Our characters are sin spoiled and stained. We need to be saved. Nevertheless, humanity is the key to the Lord's divine plans. Plans which stretch into the unknown vistas of eternity. Through us, God will put an end to evil and to the architect of evil, the devil. Part of that ultimate victory is the present mandate to preach the gospel. Indeed, it is the main part of the plan at present. God's future plans are beyond our comprehension for the moment, but unless we uphold our part now, we will instead put a hold on God's wonderful schemes. Know this, your word, if it is God's word, carries far more weight than all argument. It catches people where they are not protected. I rely upon it when preaching to thousands of people, all of whom are different. God knows best what word will reach them. As Goliath found out too late one day, the professional enemy prepared for every danger but forgot to prepare for a stone from a sling. God has many a surprise to spring on the devil. Satan doesn't understand who or what means God is likely to choose. When we move in the Holy Spirit, we always will find the Achilles seal of the devil and thus defeat him. As long as Jesus is the number one, he puts value into every zero. 
Jesus makes every zero valuable. If as long as he is the number one, we are precious. We are valuable. But take the one away and we all become nothing at the same moment. The whole key is Jesus. Why don't we shout his wonderful name? Jesus! Do you realize that Jesus planned a project greater than any pharaoh? It was simply outside human capabilities. Man could build a pyramid, but Jesus involved them in what only God could do and to demonstrate the almighty power of God. Never did any emperor or leader in history ask so much of ordinary people, but never did any ruler make so much possible by ordinary people. Jesus deliberately picked a few local men who knew nothing about anything except fishing and then sent them out to change the world. They had to go into cities and among the learned, sophisticated and the powerful, often in hostile territory and against all odds. But he equipped they went with the greatest of all life-changing forces behind them, the gospel and the Holy Spirit, truth and power. Think, if we only do what we ourselves are capable of doing, it fails to show what God can do. But obey the Lord in faith and you achieve the unachievable. Then watch out, mountains will move, the fundamental nature of Christianity is the art of the impossible. You know, I grew up in North Germany at the mouth of the river Elbe. It is a tidal area. So when the tide was out, we boys used to play in the mud. Mm -hmm. And in the mud were lying Big barges, lying barges, loaded with building materials. I don't know how heavy they were, maybe hundreds of tons or 50 tons, some bigger, some smaller. And we boys played around there. But I used to think no power on earth can move these barges. But then, all of a sudden, the tide came in and everything around those barges began to swirl. And half an hour later, I stood on the pier and I, as a 12-year-old boy, mm -hmm. was able to move these ships with one foot. That has become an illustration, a picture to me for life. When we obey the word of God, the tide comes in. The immovable becomes movable. The incurable becomes curable. And the impossible is possible. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into the world, it created a new order of possibilities 
beyond all that had been known since the days of Adam. We can all do the ordinary and trust God, but God is looking for men and women who will match their action to what they believe. When I felt the Lord commission me to take the gospel from Cape Town to Cairo, I was just a young missionary working in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho. It simply seemed impossible, if not preposterous. But I soon learned a valuable lesson. It is okay to be a zero as long as we stand next to number one. And next to Jesus, Christianity becomes the art of the impossible.